Hey, hey, this is Teresa Matsura, and you're listening to Uncanny Japan. Imagine you're out hiking in the woods in Japan, and you hear a strange sound. Something like, Chee! Next, you notice some rustling in the bushes up ahead. What is it? It's too small to be a wild boar or a bear. Maybe a baby monkey? A baby tanuki? But before you can even turn around and hightail it out of there, out pops, I mean, out rolls, a creature that looks like a short, very wide snake. But instead of slithering, as snakes are wont to do, it's got its tail in its mouth and it's rolling, end over end, toward you, very quickly. What the hell? So what is it, and what should you do? Well, I'll tell you what mysterious creature you've just stumbled across and what's the best course of action in just a few seconds. Hang in there a little while longer. Don't run away just yet. Unless it gets too close and then you might want to jump out of the way. Would you like to explore the stranger, more obscure corners of Japanese culture? Dig a little deeper into superstitions curious customs, and all those mysterious creatures that inhabit the land? If so, then this is the podcast for you. Uncanny Japan is where I, author Teresa Matsura, share all the fascinating tidbits I unearth while doing research for my writing. From the bizarre to the ghastly, and everything in between. I hope you enjoy the show. Are you still there? Good. But first, a little news. I'm happy to say that Uncanny Japan got nominated for an International Women's Podcast Award. The category being Moment of Raw Emotion. And that refers to the episode right after my father-in-law passed away. I still can't listen to that one. And Uncanny Robot got a nomination too. Moment of Dramatic Tension. So I'm very thrilled about that. Uncanny Robot also got some other nominations from some other web fest all over the world. So I'll let you know how that turns out. Now, today's episode is one of those spontaneous ones brought to you by a silly and enlightening conversation we had over on the Uncanny Japan Discord a short while ago. I'll put the Discord link in the transcripts, by the way, if you're interested. Anyway, I'll tell you more about the details of that conversation in a few minutes because Sam was the one who discovered the last bit of delightful and wild information, and I want to give him full credit for that. But first, what is this thing that you've just uncovered? Well, it's a mysterious, mythical, question mark, creature that has been seen and heard all over Japan since ancient times. It was even mentioned in the Kojiki in the 1700s. But yet, not one, again, question mark, has ever been captured. It's called Tsuchinoko. I've known about them for a long time, and I always assumed the name meant child of the dirt. I mean, it is a snake-like beastie, so it made sense. But I'd never seen the kanji until I started writing this. I'd only seen it written in katakana, the phonetic alphabet usually used for foreign words and it doesn't give you any clue to the meaning behind the term. I was surprised to learn that tsuchi means mallet or hammer, child of the mallet. Now that changes everything. The reason isn't because they hit you or anything like that, but because their body shape resembles an old-fashioned hammer or mallet called a tsuchi, or more precisely, a yokotsuchi. And yet, it does kind of look like the mythical animal. A yokotsuchi has a short little handle, which could be the tsuchinoko's wee little tail. Then it has a thick round part that is used for threshing rice or beating fabric. And that could be the tsuchinoko's wide body. But these little fellows aren't known just as tsuchinoko. There are around 40 different names depending on where you live in Japan. Some of the more adorable monikers are Bachihebi, Nozuchi, Tsuchimbo, 
and my favorite, Tatekuri Kaishi, which literally means to stand up and turn around. If you recall that hair-raising intro, that is exactly what the creature was doing. In folklore, the Tatekuri Kaishi's main objective in life is just to frighten you and watch you fall down. But since, like the wild boar, it can't change its direction quickly, you just wait until the last minute and jump out of the way. There isn't a lot written about the Tatekuri Kaishi, so that might be a very local myth. Tsuchinoko, however, are all over the place. And by all over the place, I mean they are lurking in the bushes and underbrush, in the forests and mountains all over Japan, except Hokkaido and some smaller islands. Here is a short list of observations about the Tsuchinoko from people who have purported to have encountered one. Number one. They are basically shortened, very wide in the middle, snake-looking animals. They are roughly the size of a loaf of French bread or a bottle of beer. And they weigh about 5 kilos, or a little over 10 pounds. Number two, they have eyelids, where snakes don't. Number three, boy can they jump. There are differing reports, but something like they can leap into the air five meters while springing forward two meters. Number four, they enjoy sake. Number five, their cry, or their call, sounds like chee. Number six, females have spaces between their teeth. Number seven, they're incredibly fast. Number eight, they have different ways of getting around. For example, other than making a big circle and rolling at you, they can also slither like a snake, crawl forward like an inchworm, or roll sideways like a short, fat log. Number nine, they snore. Number ten, they favor the scent of miso, dried squid, and burning hair. Who burns hair? Number eleven, Some say they are extremely poisonous, thus dangerous. And number 12, some say they can talk. Remember in episode 30 when I talked about the Jin Mengyo, or the human-faced carp? I mentioned that in the 1990s, a tabloid published a photo of an alleged Jin Mengyo, and that caused quite the sensation. The same thing happened again with Kuchisake Onna, the slit-mouthed woman. But that was back in the 1970s when a newspaper got a hold of a story about one being spotted and the whole country went nuts. Well, the same thing happened with our dear Tsuchinoko. In 1972, the author Seiko Tanabe wrote a serialized novel in the Asahi newspaper called Subete Koronda. It followed a protagonist who was crazy about the Tsuchinoko. A year later, the story was turned into an NHK drama. Then in 1973, a manga artist, Takao Yaguchi, wrote phantom monster Bachihebi. Remember, Bachihebi is just another name for Tsuchinoko. The year after that, in 1974, the darling character Doraemon even came out with an episode about finding one. So that's three years of serious Tsuchinoko attention and it set off the Tsuchinoko fad. People began searching for them everywhere. One theory is they are a type of blue-eyed lizard in the wild. It seems that was early in the 1970s that these lizards were first imported in Japan, too. So, okay, that makes sense. Except lizards have legs, and they don't move like an inchworm, or roll end over end, or roll like a log so maybe not them. Now, before we get too excited, these little beasties are believed to be cryptids or yuma, or is it uma? Unidentified, mysterious animals. While there are drawings, paintings, replicas, and even suspicious mummified remains of the ugly creatures, there aren't any living ones anywhere that we can observe. You hear reports about people who have seen them, but no captures. Despite that, you might have heard about these stout snakes because they make appearances in Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Metal Gear Solid, 
Yokai Watch, and Monster Hunter, just to name a few. Which brings me to the fun part, and the reason I felt compelled to slip this little chubby creeper episode into my usual lineup. A while ago on Discord, I was talking about some urban legend yokai or other, when listener and patron Andrew, who makes some gorgeous hand-thrown pottery, by the way, I'll put his Instagram link in the show notes. Anyway, Andrew put up an image of the Tsuchinoko and said what I was talking about reminded him of that. So several of us started discussing the Tsuchinoko for a bit. Then, totally unrelated to the Tsuchinoko, Listener, Discord member, and an amazing artist named Sam Kalinsky. He creates amazing yokai stickers. I'll put a link in the show notes to him, too. So Sam pops on after he made a snipe sticker, and he asked if there was anything in Japan similar to the hunting of the snipe. I couldn't think of anything off the top of my head, and neither could anyone else. Cue a little while later, and Sam comes back with news that a friend had actually found the Japanese equivalent to snipe hunting. And it is, drum roll, the Tsuchinoko hunt. It's really a thing. I searched around and the two prefectures I saw mentioned most were Gifu and Niigata. In Niigata, it's called the Tsuchinoko Tanken, and in Gifu, it's called Tsuchinoko Festa. Both events are held in May. Why May? Not exactly sure, but one reason I read was that the Tsuchinoko hibernates and wakes up around then. They're active, hungry, and looking for some romance. So if you're lucky, not that kind of lucky, perv. If you're the other kind of lucky, it's the best time of year to spot one. So what happens at the Tsuchinoko hunt? Basically, it's a big group of people who all gather to hike around with long-handled nets and cameras around their necks. They scour certain mountains and forests, looking for the elusive critters. In Niigata, this has been going on since 2006. And every year, after the search, both the Tsuchinoko Tonkin and the Tsuchinoko Festa groups announce that sadly, this year too, they did not manage to spot or catch one of the slippery serpents. I mean, that all sounds fun enough. But these Tsuchinoko lovers make the quest all the more enjoyable. For example, in Niigata, they've even made a theme song called the Tsuchinoko Samba. Nice, huh? So while I used to think them creepy and gross, after more consideration, I've decided they are super cute. I mean, there's their shape. And then you have all the adorable mascots and cookies, mochi, amulets, keychains, stuffed animals, you name it. All of the goods are very kawaii. Some of the replicas, not so much. But is kawaii enough to get you trekking through the bramble all day long? Sometimes two days. Because remember, they might be poisonous too. Maybe not. But you know what would get me out there? A reward. Yes, reward. Now this has been around for as long as I can remember, but I just realized the rewards are different for different prefectures and areas. But in general, if you nab yourself a real live Tsuchinoko, you can receive around 1 million yen, more or less, depending. Some places offer smaller rewards for even a good photo. So next time you're visiting Japan, or if you're already here, and you're going for a hike, grab that long-handled net and keep your eyes peeled for one of these thick little buddies. I'll end for today. I want to thank Sam for digging up the Tsuchinoko hunt information, and Andrew for reminding me after all these years about the Tsuchinoko. I'll put links to their awesome goodness up in the show notes. And while I'm on the subject of awesome goodness, It's not Japan-related, but another patron, Amy, has created a gorgeous oracle deck called the 1836 Oracle. She's a Texas native, and I was born there, so I feel really connected to her work. In her words, With these 50 cards, I have attempted to capture what we love about our home and what we hope to change for future generations. My intention is to serve as both a mirror 
and a big hug for the folks that feel worn out from riding the waves of hope and despair that come with the territory. It's truly gorgeous, so I'm going to put a link to her Kickstarter up in the transcripts as well. Thank you so much for listening, patrons. I visited the Wolf Temple Shrine, so I'll put up pictures of that soon. There's another one I'm going to drag Richard to at the end of this month. It's a fire shrine. It's a two-hour drive in the mountains, and then another two-hour hike till you get to the tippy top, where you find a very old, a very beautiful, and a very historically interesting shrine. I'll post all about that next month on the Patreon page. So everyone have a wonderful day or night. Stay well, and I will talk to you again real soon. Bye-bye. You've reached the end of the show, and I just want you to know how much we appreciate you listening and supporting us. Any subscribing, reviewing, and gushing to your friends, family, even random strangers, really does help keep us going. If you have the means and you want to help a little more and get a little more, we are making extra content over on Patreon, all for only $5 a month. Or, if you like to read horror, you might be interested in my Bram Stoker-nominated short story collection, The Carp-Faced Boy and Other Tales. Hontoni arigato gozaimasu. Thank you again, and I'll talk to you real soon. Thank you.